Phalanx Games sent me Freedom, so let's get it to the table. Freedom is a two-player war game that focuses on area control. It's set during the Greek War of Independence, and players will take control of either the Imperial forces who are trying to capture the city by having a unit in one of the four forts on the wall, or having a unit on any space of the southern part of the board or the city, or you will play as the insurgents who are trying to withstand the attack and last till the end of the six rounds. On top of those goals, if your morale ever drops to zero, you will automatically lose. The board is set up with units automatically placed in specific areas on the board. The Imperial player, or the Red player, will start with 30 units, 2 cannons on the map, with 5 units and 1 cannon placed in the camp. The Insurgent player, or the Blue player, will start with 9 units, with each island having an additional one, 4 cannons, and 8 civilians within the city. Players will start with a set number of morale, money, supplies, population, and plea for funds or help. Cards will be split into two decks. The A deck will be used during the rounds 1 through 3, and the B deck will be used during the rounds 4 through 6. Each player will start with 8 cards from the A deck. Now there are 5 phases in each round, and during the administration phase, which is skipped in round 1, you will move the round tracker forward, and if it's the 5th or 6th round, the red player will actually lose 1 morale at this time. But mainly in this phase, players will draw 7 new cards from the deck that matches that round. During the opening phase, the red player will perform an advancement actions and choose a row and moves up to 5 units 1 space forward. The blue player will perform a regroup action and choose one of his units and moves it anywhere he wants within the city or islands. Each space within the city can only have a limit of 2 units with the islands of limiting to 1 unit. This player can never move units outside of the wall. The gameplay focuses on the action phase where players will take turn playing 7 cards from their hand. Each player should end the round with one leftover card that can be kept in their hand for the next round. When playing cards, you will use the card for its ability shown with the text, or for the card's action points that are shown on the top left. Now you can only use the card ability if the card is your color, or gray, which is considered a neutral color. If you play a card of the other player's color, you will be using it for its action points, and you can spin them doing any number of actions that you are allowed. If you do play a card of the other player's color for the action points, when it's the other player's turn, they have the choice to discard one of the cards in their hand to take the ability listed on the card that you just played. Now let's go over some possible actions that the Imperial player can do. Normal movement costs one action point each and lets you choose two of your units to move one space each, or choosing one unit to move two spaces. These units can never move backwards. Slow movement costs one action point and lets the player move one unit, one space, in areas that require this type of movement, like spaces around the island, spaces around the southern part of the city, and spaces on the wall. The Imperial units can only have a limit of three units per space, and if and when they get on the wall, they will be limited to two units per space. The attack action costs one action point, and units will attack adjacent spaces with units from the other player. Two d8s are rolled, and with the results of anything that's eight or higher, the attack is successful. Whenever the last unit is removed from a space, the opposing player can choose to either increase their morale by one, or decrease the other player's morale by one. Now when attacking on a space on the wall, from the main area, there is a plus one bonus for the Imperial player for every damage on that space. There can be up to 2 damage, so if this happens, a roll of a 6, 7, or 8 would be considered successful. The 4 forts have better defenses and gives a negative 1 to the Imperial player's roll. Reward attack costs 1 action point and 1 money. This results in a plus 2 bonus to all rolls for attacks performed on the same turn, meaning the remaining action points from the same card. Preparation costs one action point and allows the player to store action points for future use. These action points can only be used when wanting to perform an action that would otherwise be unable to perform. Support area costs two action points. Now if you look at the surrounding areas map, you can see who controls each area by the color of tile on it. If this area has support markers on it, it will strengthen the player's control of it. With the action, you will either add a support marker on a tile under your control, or remove a support marker from the other players on one of their tiles. Or if no support markers are on a tile of the other players, then you can flip that tile over to the other side to show your color 
and now this area is under your control. Plea for funds from the high port costs three action points. For the Imperial player, help will be easy at the beginning and tougher as time goes on. Two d6s are rolled and if the result is less than 12, the plea is successful. And the player gets three money and moves the marker on the plea track two spaces forward. Now the next time that you will perform this action, you will have a plus two penalty on the result of the dice. If it is successful a second time, then a plus four penalty will be used and so on. Lastly, you can build a cannon which costs either 3, 5, or 7 action points depending on which row that you want to add the cannon to. The third row will cost you 3, and the row adjacent to the wall will cost you 7. To build a cannon, you will need to have the action points to do so, have an available cannon in the camp area, you will need to have a unit in the space where you want it to be built, and there can't be another cannon in that same space. The black cubes represent cannons. Those are all the actions that the Imperial player can perform. Now the Insurgent player has actions that are similar as well as unique. The player can regroup at a cost of one action point. This is the same action that is performed during the open phase, but one unit can be moved anywhere in the city or islands. Attacking costs one action point and is similar to the other player except for the result of a 6, 7, or 8 counts as a success for the Insurgents. And unlike the Imperials, the Insurgent units can perform multiple attacks in the same turn. Preparation costs one action point and will store the action point for the use of bigger actions like Raid, Plead for Help, Repair the Wall, Train Civilians, and Build Cannons. Support area costs two action points and it is the same action as I explained that the Imperials can perform. Raid costs different amount depending on how far you are raiding from the walls. If the raid is in the third row, it will cost three action points. If done on the first row, then it will cost one. To raid, there will need to be no other imperial units in the spaces between the target and the wall. The player will roll a d8, and a result of five or higher is a success, and the imperial unit will be removed from that space. Plea for help from the government costs three action points. In the beginning, the government most likely won't respond, but after a lot of pressure, it may eventually give and provide some help. The marker on the plea track is moved one space forward. At the end of the round, there is a check for success roll, with each space on the track counting as a plus one to that roll. Repairing the wall will cost four action points, and the insurgent player must have a unit in that space to repair it. Trained civilians cost four action points. The insurgent player will remove a civilian cube from the city and add a new unit anywhere he wants. Build Cannon costs 4 action points plus 1 supply. The player must have a unit in the space where the cannon will be built. Now, those are all the actions available for the Insurgent player. After all players have used their actions, you will go to the next phase. The next phase is the Cannon phase where the cannons were all fire. Players take turns choosing a cannon, announcing where they will fire, and rolls 2 d6s. The cannons can target in a pattern from its space expanding outwards as you see here. This is also the case for the opposing player, as you can see here. The distance to which the cannon fire determines its chances for success. Adjacent spaces needs a 4 or higher, and a space that is 3 spaces away would need a 6 for it to hit. If both dice are successful, then they both will hit. During the second half of the game, allied units can control a cannon and will have a plus 1 bonus. The special cannon that the insurgent player controls also gets a plus one bonus to each roll and can also fire to the fourth row from the walls. Cannons on the islands and those located in the southern part of the wall will have their own rules that can fire on certain areas. When the imperial player fires against a space on the wall, each hit causes damage to the wall. The first hit causes the wall to be damaged and the second will cause the wall to be destroyed. The next phase is the replenish phase. Players will gain rewards based on the areas that they are under control in the surrounding areas map and will also spend resources based on their current status. I should mention that during 1825, Ibrahim arrived outside the city with many Egyptian units and ships. After the first three rounds, changes are made to the game giving the Imperial player some more units and supplies while the Insurgent player gains 10 civilians and plus one on his plea track. There are also other changes done at this point that will change the game a bit. The game focuses on area control as well as card play. 
Timing of each card becomes important, as you don't want to play a card of another player's color during the wrong time because they have a chance to discard a card on their turn and take the event listed on the card that you just used. There is a strategy in itself and when to use certain cards, and when to use the action on the cards and when to use the action points on the card. The game is very replayable, as cards will be different each time you play. The way you use one of the cards will be different, and due to this, your strategy will change each time you play. Strategies will change on where to attack and how to defend. The minimum age that I would think someone could play this game is probably around 12 years old. I think maybe younger players could play it, but they wouldn't be able to grasp and form more strategies to win the game. The game isn't super complex, but enough to make the game fun and different each time you play it. If you need a great two-player game, you should check this one out. Again, this is Freedom by Phalanx Games. If you like what you see, then go back it.